So, um, have you got have you got your answer sheets? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, as usual, please don't forget to write your names. All right, and then we will get started with the test. All right. Question number one: True or false? An heir who is a minor is as good as a slave. An heir who is a minor is as good as a slave. Question number two. We are granted more in Christ than Adam ever had. We are granted more in Christ than Adam ever had. Question number three, observing any day, including the Sabbath, as means of salvation is wrong. Observing any day, including the Sabbath, as means of salvation is wrong. Question number four, Paul, as an apostle, could not have a physical health challenge. Paul, being an apostle, could not have a physical health challenge. Question number five, true or false? Under the law is Okay, let me take that up again. Under the law is grace that, or was grace that made one righteous. Under the law, hmm, I don't know what I was trying to say there. Under the law, it was grace that made one righteous. That sounds better. Under the law, it was grace that made one righteous. Question number six, true or false? Ishmael was Abraham's son of promise. Ishmael was Abraham's son of promise. Question number seven, Moses received the law from Mount Zion. Moses received the law from Mount Zion. Question number eight, observing the law is the same as going under bondage. Observing the law or trying to observe the law is the same as going under bondage. Question number 10. Under the law, it's what you do for God that makes you right. Under the law, it is what you do for God that makes you right. Let us skip number 10 and move on to number 11. I wonder why I had 11 questions today, but uh, cancel question number 10 and let us move on to question number 11. You are rooted in grace by observing the law. You are rooted in grace by observing the law. Okay, so much for our test tonight. And um, will you please kindly stop writing and please hand in your answer sheets.
Okay, so let us revise our test for tonight. Question number one, an heir who is a minor is as good as a slave. True. Yes, that's a simple one. Question number two, we are granted more in Christ than Adam ever had. True. Very, very true. Okay. Question number three, observing any day, any day including Sabbath, as a means of salvation is wrong. True. True. Okay. What happened to the chorus? Others went silent there. <laughs> okay. Question number four. Paul is an apostle could not have a physical health challenge. False. It's false. false. Paul talks about the fact that um, when he went to Galatia, he had a challenge with his eyesight or something. And uh, yeah, so it's false to say that um, uh, as an apostle, uh, it was impossible for one to have physical health uh, challenges. Question number five, under the law, it was grace that made one righteous. Oh. It's false, okay? The law and grace, they don't work together, okay? One at a time. Question number six, Ishmael was Abraham's son of promise. False. False. It was Isaac. Question number seven, Moses received the law from Mount Zion. False. Okay. Mount Zion is the mountain on which Jerusalem was built. Okay. So sometimes these words are used interchangeably, Jerusalem or Zion. So Moses was given the law on Mount Sinai. Question number eight, observing the law is the same as going under bondage. True. Very true. Question number nine, under the law, it was what you do for God that made you right. True. Very true. And then we canceled number 10. And then we are looking at question number 11. You are rooted in grace by observing the law. Oh, sure. All right. Okay. So I think that was easy. Um, to me, well, what it means is that uh, you understood the lesson last night. So let's see how we fared. Um, 10 out of 10? Oh, oh, that's beautiful. I like I like seeing so many hands, okay? Uh, 9 out of 10? 8 out of 10? Okay, there you go. Right, that's good. 7 out of 10? Wow, beautiful. Uh, 6 out of 10? Five out of ten, four out of ten, three out of ten, one out of ten, zero out of ten. So congratulations. I see we all did extremely well today. Um, that's good. Keep it up. Right. Now, we, we proceed with our... Um, study for tonight and tonight we are looking at the book of Galatians once again uh, chapter number five um, as usual let us take our time to read through the book and as we read let us listen attentively okay 
So let us open our Bibles to the book of Galatians, and we are looking at chapter number five. But before you do that, uh, once again, let me just give you an overview of what to expect in chapter number five. Chapter number five is mainly um, about the freedom that we have in Christ. Now, um, perhaps we need someone to define for us what does freedom mean? What does freedom mean? Unshackled. Sorry? Unshackled. Unshackled, okay. I like that because you are free. You are not tied. Okay, what else? I was going to say unbridled. Um, Sister Bella, can you come again? I can't hear you. I was going to say unbridled. Um, I can hardly hear the last word. Unbridled, like a horse without a... Un unbridled, okay, okay, okay. Yes, um, that's yet another good um, um, definition of uh, freedom. I'll say, what else? Uh, independent. Payment? Independence. I'm, I'm not hearing you In, properly. Independence. Independence, you say. Okay, okay, okay. All right, yeah. Yeah, to an extent, yes. Okay. Um, freedom is a multifaceted concept that can be understood from various perspectives. At its core, freedom uh, signifies the power or right to act, speak, and change as one wants without hindrance. That, that's what uh, somebody is saying uh, freedom is. But anyway, um, the, impo uh, the most important thing is that at least we have an idea we understand what freedom means. Okay, so chapter number five is all about our freedom in Christ. And we will notice that in chapter number five, Paul uh, is trying to explore the freedom that believers have in Christ and, you know, compares that with um, the dangers of legalism. Okay, and then he goes on to conclude that chapter by discussing the fruits of the spirit and contrast with the works of the flesh. So basically, these are the three major points uh, for us to look out for as we read Galatians chapter number five. So I want someone to read Galatians chapter number five Verse, uh, verse 1 through verse number 6. I'll read. Okay. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debt, debtor to keep the whole law. You have become in, entangled with Christ and who attempts to justify by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, we through the Spirit eagerly await, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor, 
nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith working through love. Amen. Thank you. Somebody read verse number seven through verse number twelve. You were running a good race. You cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever you may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, at least they will go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Okay. Good. Thank you. Someone read verse 13 to verse number 18. For you, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but to love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself if you are if you bite and devour one another beware lest you be consumed by one another i say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the last of the flesh for the flesh lasts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that so that you do not you do not do the things that you will. Okay, thank you. Someone read verses nineteen to twenty six. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbreaks of anger, dispute, dissension, faction, having, drunkenness, carousy, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. All right, thank you so much. So this is what we have in chapter number five. Um, all what we are seeing is that uh, now Paul is trying to go towards concluding what he just said from chapters one to chapter number four. You see, it is like now he is trying to take it easy and prepare his audience, the Galatians, for a smooth landing. So, that being the case, as we look at verse number one of chapter number five, we see there what can be referred to as a summary statement 
in light of all that Paul has said previously, he now challenges the Galatians to walk in the truth that he has presented. Can you see this tone? Somebody read verse number one once again. Stand fast, therefore, in a liberty or in a liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Okay, so it's like you know, these guys have been on a roller coaster. You know, when you ride the roller coaster, you are taken up and then you are brought down. So this is exactly what I, I am seeing here. Paul has just, you know, been talking, you know, using hard language to emphasize the truth that he wants the Galatians to embrace. And now, He's softening the tone as if he wants them to buy into what he has just said. He says, it is therefore good for you to embrace the freedom that we have in Christ. You see, I like this style of writing that Paul is employing here. He has given reason. He has shown the facts. He has proved beyond any reasonable doubt. And he is saying now, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Why don't you stand Stand firm in Christ because of the freedom that we have. So look at point A in your notes. Can somebody read point A for me? Stand firm in Christ. Point A in your notes under chapter 5. Say uh, 19 to 21. No, point number A in your notes. Significantly, yes. Christ who is made us free. We do mm -hmm. not free ourselves free. Mm -hmm. We struggle to free ourselves. We, we, we just become more entangled with a yoke of bondage. Listen, class, isn't this powerful? Is, isn't this true? It is Christ who has made us free. And should we try to free ourselves, we are simply worsening the situation. A great point to be observed here. And number two, The liberty is our, our freedom from the tyranny of having to end our own way to God. The freedom from sin and guilt and condemnation. Freedom from the penalty and the power and eventually freedom from the presence of, from the presence of sin. This is only possible through Christ Jesus. And I think the idea has been well sold. Look at Romans chapter number eight, verse number one for a moment. Can somebody read Romans chapter number eight, verse number one, in addition to what we are seeing here, just to consolidate this point. Romans chapter eight, verse number one. Therefore, now there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Who do there not is therefore no, okay. No Thank you. To those there is now therefore no condemnation 
for those they, that are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is not simply a truth for the Galatians. It is also a truth for all of us mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, we have our roots in Christ Jesus because we cannot miss this, all right? Therefore, we need to stand fast. And standing fast means it takes an effort to stay in this place of liberty. Very powerful class. It takes an effort on your part, on my part, for all of us to stay in the liberty that there is in Christ Jesus. Well said, Paul. Now we move on to verses two through four. Now in verses two through four, Paul has just appealed to the Galatians to stand fast in the freedom. And now he goes further in verses two th uh, through four to show and talk about the danger of embracing the law as a way to walk with God. And what are the dangers? Point number one, look at verse number two. What is the, uh, danger number one of embracing the law? Can somebody read verse number two and then you tell me the danger from that verse? Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Okay. So what is the danger, number one, of trying to seek justification by the law? Observing the tradition of circumcision. What is the danger if one were to observe the tradition of circumcision as prescribed in the law. What is the danger? Profit nothing. The danger is that when once when one wants to seek justification by observing the law, Christ profits him nothing. That's danger number one. Okay, Christ would profit you nothing. Because in other words, you are out of Christ and trying to do your own thing, which does not work. So yes, if you have become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. When you embrace the law as our rule of walking with God, we must let go of Jesus. He is no longer our righteousness. We attempt to end it ourselves. Something that we mentioned to say that it is impossible for us to work and end salvation. So danger number one, if one tries, look at Paul is specifically talking about circumcision because what these Judaizing teachers were trying to get the Galatians to do was for them to be circumcised as a requirement under the law. And Paul, you know, circumcision was a major, major thing for those that observed the law. So they want to take, you know, a bit of what they thought was very important from the Old Testament and persuade these guys to observe it. You see how tricky the devil is and how misleading this is. Perhaps they say to these guys, you don't really need to observe all the law because they knew uh, what the, the law required would automatically you know, uh, dissuade these people from following the law. Things like you know, having to buy animals for sacrifice. 
They never talked about that. But what they viewed as important, I think the same attitude we see in the church today. Some people look at certain practices within the church and say, okay, you can ignore such a thing and do such a thing in place of what, uh, what you would have done, what you, have, you would have failed to do and God will understand. Class, it doesn't work like that. So the major point is that Paul is saying, if they try to do a thing in order for them to be justified before God, Christ is profiting them nothing. And we move on to say that. Um, um, you mean? Yes. May I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, there are a lot of people today yeah. that would like to fall under the Jewish rule which is like mm -hmm. keeping the Sabbath and mm -hmm. um, the laws of Israel. Yes. Especially the ecumenical churches today. Um, isn't that the, exactly the same as being circumcised? Yes, in a way, it is the same. It is the same in the sense that... Um, you see, all these practices fall under one umbrella that mm. I would call uh, false doctrine. Yes. Anything that God has not prescribed in his word is false. Okay? So, yes, false doctrine now comes in different forms. And whatever form it is that false doctrine is presented it cannot be justified. So, before God, in fact, uh, James talks about such a thing that um, if you fail in one commandment, Correct. you would have failed in all. Because the one who said, thou shalt not steal, is the one who also said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So, meaning to say, um, false doctrine in whatever form is not acceptable before God and we cannot condone it for whatever reason. Good point, Sister Bella. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, as we proceed, the system of grace and the system of law are incompatible. We cannot mix the two. You see, I think this is basically human nature. We think, you know, we would impress God by adding on to what he has commanded us to do. But, you know, God doesn't act that way. So, Calvin, quoting Calvin, he said, whoever wants to have half Christ loses the whole. A very powerful statement. You cannot have half Christ and seek something else to take care of the other half. He, Calvin says, when you do that, you lose the whole. Very strong point, class. Okay? So, circumcision is the seal of the law. I didn't mention about circumcision. And why Paul is particularly mentioning circumcision because you know understand this class you know without circumcision uh the way it was viewed in the old testament and the way it was received and practiced by those that observed the old testament without circumcision one was considered to have been completely outside the law and Paul is picking on that. He says, if you are circumcised for the need of salvation, then you are out. Very strong point. Very, very strong. Now, let us move on to verse number three. We have seen the first point that Paul has discussed uh, 
as a danger of embracing or, uh, the law. The first point is that Christ will profit you nothing. Let us move on to verse number three. Can somebody read verse number three? And testify against every man who receives the concession that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You see now, I did mention to say that uh, circumcision was considered the main thing in as, in as far as observing the law is concerned. And Paul is saying, okay, fine. The way you have upgraded circumcision, if you think you'll be justified through circumcision, you need to understand that it should not be exclusively circumcision. It has to be inclusive. Circumcision, including some other laws that there are in the Old Testament. You see? So this complicates the whole thing. And all what is, is being said here is that why not choose freedom? Why not choose Christ? Where you don't have the burden of trying to do something that you definitely cannot win at. So there is a case. It should not be circumcision only. It should not be the Sabbath only. It should not be observing or whatever day it is only. It has to be if you want to choose, you observe whatever you want to observe in addition to all other 613 laws. Can you see how impossible it is, church, um, class? So when we choose to walk by the law, we must walk by the whole law. Let us move on to verse number four. For the third reason why, uh, in as far as the danger of embracing the law is concerned, let us move on to verse number four and read verse number four. You have become a spring from Christ. Is it correct? Yeah. You have become a spring from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law. You are pulling. Okay. From All right. So that's verse number four that you just read. My translation says you are trying to be justified by the law. You have been alienated from Christ. And other translations say, uh, I mean, translations say you have fallen from grace. Just think about this for a moment. What can we be without the grace that there is in Christ Jesus? Let us turn our Bibles, our Bibles to the book of John, chapter number one. There is something that I want us to look at for a moment. John, the gospel according to John, chapter number one. Um, are you there yet? John chapter number one, verse number one. Can somebody read verse number one? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse number two. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him okay. was... So, Yes, a point is, okay, if you could just stop there, that's fine. In the beginning, there was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. 
And then the writer goes on to explain that everything that there is now was created through the word. And look at verse number 14. Look at verse number 14 now. Can somebody read? And the word became fresh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just imagine. The word that was in the beginning with God, the word through which all creation was created, became what? flesh and it dwelt where among us. among us full of what grace and truth all right there you are so with this understanding that now we have of who jesus is the understanding that now jesus is not only god but he is himself grace and truth. Now, let us compare this with what Paul has just said in verse number four. When you seek justification from the law before God, you would have fallen from grace. Class, given a choice, what would we choose? Would we choose the law? Or would you choose grace? Grace. Okay. You said it yourself. All right? So, we have been given three reasons. So, to fall from grace means to lose the atonement, the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness, the liberty, and life which Jesus has merited for us by his death and resurrection. To lose the grace of God means to gain the wrath or the anger and judgment of God, death, the bondage of the devil, and everlasting condemnation, quoting from Luther. So, brothers and sisters, here we are. Truth has been said. The pitfall has been exposed. The decision is all ours. What is it that we would want to opt for? Would we want to seek justification by observing the law? Or we, we would rather go the freedom way and be under Christ so that we can be declared righteous before God because of Christ. And one thing that John mentioned was the fact that besides being grace, Christ was the truth. You know, talking of the truth, the world is now in more confusion because it appears like we really don't know what to believe. You see, truth is only found in Christ and in God's word. Look at what we call truth as humans. What we as humans would call truth today may not be necessarily the truth tomorrow. Is this true? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's true. Okay. Look at or even the advances in medical science. There are certain practices that are, are now being questioned, but those practices were embraced as being the right way of, you know, uh, going about it. And this is exactly how it is. 
today we might believe something to be true, but with time we would say, but I think we were wrong. The truth is, it's not like, it's not like that with God. With God, truth is absolute. It remains truth. And whatever God says, you see, I was telling the congregation in our Bible study uh, one of the days, I said, uh, sometimes you look at the practices that we do as the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ. Okay, take for example, somebody came and worshipped with us and he said, uh, Preacher, I think I observed something that is very strange when I worshipped with you this morning. And I said, what is it? He said, I noticed there was not even one woman who was asked to lead song, to pray, and let alone to preach. And then I said to him, what's wrong with that? He said, in this day, in this century, I said, what are you talking about? It's not about postmodernism. It's about the Bible. The fact that women in the Lord's Church are not allowed to preach, pray, and do all sorts does not make them second-class citizens of heaven. It's simply a question of roles. He said, where, where is all this coming from? And then I showed him the scriptures. He said, yeah, but I think mm, in the few years or many other years to come, as a, as a church, you're going to face problems because right now women are being empowered. They are going to rebel against this practice. I said, if it's God who instituted this, I have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear because God is truth remains the, the truth and it stands. Right, class, thank you so much. Um, it's now eight o'clock as usual. Let us take a break and then we will come and run through the remaining verses. Trust me, we will complete our course on time. Let us take a break. Thank you. Thank you. I'll proceed. Um, from verse number five. From verse number five and verse number six, the answer of faith to the legalists. Paul is just trying to put finishing touches as it were. And his language is more of now trying to nail it so that the truth that he has just presented remains unchallenged. So that whoever has love for truth has nothing to stop him or her. The facts have been laid. And if it's a case, it has been proven beyond any doubt that this is the way that things have to go. So let us look at verse number five and six. I want to move very quickly with these uh, verses now. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Mm. What a statement. In Christ, circumcision is no value. That's a very bold statement, isn't it? Considering what we just said about how circumcision was viewed. In Christ, circumcision is, has no value. He says, the only thing that counts, the only thing, and I, you know, this language is very powerful. When he says the only thing, it means there is no any other. 
it's exclusive. The only thing that counts is what? Did you see it? Did you hear it? Mm -hmm. The only thing that counts. Can somebody answer me? Yeah. Faith, okay? Faith is the only thing. And how is this faith, how should it be expressed? Working through love. Very powerful. Okay? Faith expressing itself through love is all that matters, is all that there is in Christ Jesus. Now, let us talk about love a little bit. Is this statement trying to give us... Um, Um, what word is it that I want to use here? Is this statement trying to give us choice here? Or it is a statement that is commanding us to express ourselves, the faith that is in us, to express it through love? What do you think? Do we have a choice? There's, I was just thinking uh, in John 13, verse 34, a new command I give to you to love one another. So love is a command. Okay. A good scripture. Thank you. So, the thing is, we have no choice. I have to love God. I have to love my brother. I have to love my sister. And that is a demonstration of the faith that I might have. And um, again, it's something that Paul is trying to introduce here. Yes, he has introduced it, but not in a very clear and well-pronounced manner. Uh, in the verses before this one. But from verse number six, he is now trying, or rather he is trying to make it clearer so that they are now in this new light. You see, it's a package. What Paul is saying cannot be said in installments, meaning to say, Paul is not saying, okay, I've told them to do this and that, but I think uh, I'll stop here. And when I, when I get an opportunity, then I'll tell them, uh, from where I stopped the last time, now you need to move on and do this and that. No, no, no. He is presenting a complete package, and we thank God for that. So, we see now the final confrontation that is presented in verses 7 through verse number 12. I would want somebody to read those five verses, verse number 7 through verse number 12, please. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leaves the whole lamp of doubt. Have you confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view but the one who is disturbing you who bear his judgment, whoever he is? But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the clause have been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Okay. What a confrontation. Now let us look at the notes. 
Can somebody read for me what Lightfoot is saying about the word hindrance? Lightfoot. Somebody read. Lightfoot on hinder. A metaphor yes. from military operations. The word signifies to break up a road so as to render it impassable. It's therefore opposite of to clear a way. Galatians were doing well until someone broke up the road they ran on. All right. That's very powerful, isn't it? You see, I, I like it when um, you go into the original Greek language in which this letter was written and you pick some words, okay? Because the Greek language was so rich. You pick a word and you study the word as it was understood then. Then it becomes more meaningful and it makes much more sense. So Lightfoot is saying, when Paul talks about the fact that uh, he's asking the Galatians who hindered them. It is a metaphor derived from the military operations. And it means to break up a road so as to render it impos impossible and therefore the opposite of to clear a way. The Galatians were doing very well until someone broke up the road they were running. Are you seeing this class? The meaning of what was happening, the meaning of what they were doing. It's like a well-paved road that they were walking on is no longer impossible because all sorts of obstacles have been thrown into the way. I can just imagine that uh, when the Galatians read this statement, they said, who is this how serious it is? Indeed, it was serious. And for us to be reading this today, we should only thank God because here we are seated, studying and trying to appreciate what is being said in his word. Okay, in verse number nine, he says, a little leaven, leaven or leaven, leavens the whole lamp. A little yeast will affect the whole door. You see, I think this speaks to our view of sin. In our minds, we grade sin to say, this is a better sin, or this is a smaller sin, but this one is a big sin. As humans, we do that. If I were to ask, which one do you think is a big sin? Between lying and murdering a person. What are you saying? 
It's not big as sin. Sin is sin. No, no, no. I, I, I want us just to think as human beings, okay? Let okay. us put the Bible aside and think like human beings. You say the lesser evil one. <laughs> yes. Okay. Huh? How about stealing, stealing a matchbox and stealing a car? Mm -hmm. A car stealing a matchbox. <laughs> All right. Yeah. This is how it is like, you know, this is how it plays out in our minds. Okay. And Paul is saying before God, it doesn't work like that. That small leaven, it leavens the whole lamp. And what does that mean to us? It means that if we are to tow the, the line, we have to toe the line as it is given by God without any additions, without any subtractions. If it's grace. Father, my, my great father in law used to say that disobedience is the biggest sin. Because any sin is disobedience, sin, God. Any sin is disobedience to God. Yes. Yeah. Any sin is disobedience, okay? I, I like that, and I can buy into that. So, a point has been made here. And the Galatians, I think by this time, they should have been shaking in their shoes to understand what Paul is presenting here, the gravity of what they were trying to play with. Okay? So, that's verse number 9. It is a very strong warning indeed. Okay. And look at what he says in verse number 10. He says, I have confidence in you. Wanting to leave the confrontation on a positive note, Paul expresses his confidence in the Galatians which is really a confidence in the Lord who is able to keep them. I like this approach, okay? Paul is saying, I trust you, Galatians. All is not lost. You are not that bad, okay? And he had confidence. You see, this is something that I would rather also want to think it is psychological. You see, when we give people a chance to prove themselves, it is good for us to let them know how much we believe in them, be it our children, be it our spouses, be it anybody, if one messes up and we correct, I think we can take a leaf from what Paul is saying here. We need to show that individual that all is not lo lost. We trust, we still trust and believe in him. Especially where God, where God is involved. Because suddenly, God would step in and ma make it much more easier for anyone to come back and tow the line. So I like this statement when Paul says he had confidence in them. And then he's going on to say something else in verse number 11. What is he saying in verse number 11? If he were still preaching circumcision, then, why was he still being persecuted? Mind you, Paul, throughout his preaching missions, he was facing hardships. He was facing trials. He was facing persecution, but he did not give up. And now he's trying to show them, based on that that uh, 
it was reason enough to show that he meant what he was teaching and what he stood for. So again, it is up to the Galatians to think about and come to a better conclusion. So Paul says, why am I still persecuted? But right quick, I want us to look at verse number 12. Can somebody read verse number 12 for us, please? As for those agitators, I wish they would go their own way and in a school I can see us. Okay. What is he talking about here in this verse? He says, in my translation, the, um, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. What is he talking about? Okay, right quick. Verse number 12 of Galatians chapter number 5 falls within the category of verses that we refer to as some difficult passages in the Bible. All right? This word was habitually used to describe the practice of mutilation, which was so prevalent in the Phrygian worship of a god called Cyber. The Galatians were necessarily familiar with it, and it can hardly bear any other sense. So, what Paul is talking about was that um, the practice that was well known within the region of Galatia was that people would cut themselves in worship to other idols. And Paul is saying they should not only cut themselves, but they should actually mutilate, cut off body parts to show seriousness if they are serious about their legalism. So again, it is a challenge that Paul is throwing in the open, all right? I thought maybe I, I, I would just mention that in passing. You can still go and research more on the verse if you like, but basically this is what the verse is about. Now, having said that, we are now moving on to verse number 13 through the end of the chapter where the focus now is about life by the spirit. This is so important because within the circles of observing the law, it is something that is physical. No spirit involved, okay? It's something that you do. And then God makes a decision whether to pronounce you right. But now, we need to understand this class, that in the New Testament, whatever we do is because of the Spirit of God that is within us. It might be something that you never thought about or something that was never said to you in the way that I'm saying it tonight. But this is where we are going to now with Paul, with his argument. Look at how he is introducing the idea of God the Spirit within us as Christians. Can somebody read verse number 13? You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather serve one another in love. Okay, verse number 14. Law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Okay. Now, up until verse number 15, he has introduced something that he hinted about in the previous verses. But he is talking about interpersonal relationships that has to pre prevail amongst us as Christians as we relate one to another. He is saying we need to save one another in love. And that we need to understand that when we backbite each other, that way we are devouring each other. I think as Christians, it's something that we need to be thinking about every day. How is it that I relate to my brother? And how is it that I relate to my sister? Somebody quoted for us, John chapter number 13, verse number 34, a new law I give you that you love one another. And when you love an one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. Yes, we have different opinions. Yes, sometimes we may differ the way we look and you know, perceive things. But despite all that, we need to dwell on this truth, the truth that we love one another. But wait a minute. It just can't happen that I end up loving my brother, loving my sister. It is made possible by what God has provided for us for that to be possible. Look at verse number 16. He says, what does he say in verse number 16? He say then, walk in, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the last of the flesh. 17. For the flesh lasts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these okay. are... All right. Go on. And these are contrary to one another. So... All right. That mm -hmm. you do the same as you... as that you wish. Mm -hmm. Right. You see... When you go wrong in one area, you are certainly going wrong in another. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. Paul is saying, there is the flesh and there is the spirit. And what is of the flesh contradicts that which is of the spirit. And we as Christians, we are under which one? The flesh or the spirit? It is the spirit. Huh? The spirit. The spirit. You need to watch out some of these statements because it might turn up coming in your tests, okay? I'm just giving a hint here. So, so, if the spirit is contrary to the flesh, how do we get the spirit? Is it through the works of the law? It is impossible. But the, the spirit is only possible through grace. Do you see where it is all going now? And now he goes on to say in verse number 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Do you see the conclusion now? If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And without the Spirit, you cannot love. And this is how complicated it is. The thing is. So, the Galatians had to understand this. And you and I, we also have to understand. Because it has to do with the faith that we now profess to have in Christ Jesus. It's, only, it's not only for the Galatians. It is also for us to understand. Now, we'll go on and see Paul talk about the fruits of the spirit, uh, of the flesh. Okay? I want somebody to read for me ex, I mean, uh, verses 19 through verse number 21, please. 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, Reverently, and the and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things would not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy. Okay, if you can stop there, my brother. Thank you so much. All right. Now, I want us to turn to our notes. Let us look at our notes, okay? And um, examples of the works of the flesh, that walking in the spirit helps us to overcome. Can somebody read the first paragraph for me, please? Walking in the spirit is the key, but it doesn't always come easily. Often it is a battle. There is a battle going inside the Christian and the Sorry. Bible. Sorry. Sorry, sister. I reading where it says the battle between spirit and flesh. Yeah. Can you see that um paragraph where it says the battle between spirit? Page 41. Okay. Can, the yes, battle, that's where I want you to. Yes. Okay. The battle between spirit and flesh is an interior, invisible battle. The results are actually evident. Some have thought to organize mm. this in for categories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Special things. Religious sin, interpersonal sin, and social sin. We shouldn't regard this as an exhaustive list, but it's adequate to give the idea of what the person who walks in the fresh does. Okay, so there you are. The battle between the spirit and the flesh goes on within. Okay? It is an invisible battle, but the results are seen outside. And of course, we have seen that um, some have tried to categorize the list of these works of the flesh that Paul has given in verses 19 through 21 as sensual sins okay uh these are the category of sexual sins okay to make it lighter and 
there are religious scenes where he talks about idolatry and so on and so forth, okay? And he's talking about interpersonal scenes where he is talking about um, selfishness, jealous, you know, and so on and so forth. And he's talking about social scenes uh, where he talks about OGs, uh, outbursts of anger, and so on and so forth. So it is quite a good uh, um, classification of these. But the bottom line is that uh, he hasn't listed all of the scenes. But this gives us an idea of the struggles or the things or the fruit that shows when one is walking according to the flesh. And because the first sins are, understand, are understood in relation to marriage, it's also important to understand what marriage is. Well, what is marriage? You see, brothers and sisters, marriage is an institution that was set up by God himself. And it is the basis of us as humans, church, society, nations, you name it. And the devil is very much aware of that, such that he is now attacking the marriage institution left, right, and center. Okay? I um, encourage people to, when we come to issues to do with marriage, to observe what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 13. The Bible says marriage is honorable before God. And God is going to judge adulterers. You know what? As preachers, sometimes we fear mentioning things that have to do with marriages for fear of the fact that some of those people that we are preaching to would have come from broken marriages and whatever it is. But whatever the case, I think as Christians, if something is not right, we need to ask for God's guidance to make things right. Okay? Let me stop there for a, a moment. Now, he talks about, you know, let me look at some of the things that um, he's talking about here. He's talking about things like um, uncleanliness. It also covers impure speech or suggestive speaking filled with double meanings. The Holy Spirit never led anyone into uncleanliness. And then look at lewdness. Lewdness. For you Zimbabweans in the class, it's about kukara, which is sometimes translated as licentiousness. It has the idea of ready to sin anytime. <laughs> Just imagine. A Christian who is ready to sin. It speaks of someone who flouts their immorality, throwing off all restraints and having no sense of shame propriety, 
or embarrassment. And this is what Mori is talking about. As Christians, we need to restrain ourselves and let the Spirit of God control us. Okay? And then he goes on to talk about sorcery, blah, 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 and whatever it is, you can read all those others um, uh, in, your, uh, in your spare time. Now, I want us to move on. Okay? I have just touched on certain examples, all right? Uh, certain examples of uh, what he is um, talking about. Let me see. Is there any other that um, uh, I might perhaps want to talk about? Okay, L let us look at F. The scene that is under F. Dissensions. Dissensions uses the Greek word, and I've got the word there. It literally means standing apart. Standing apart. All right. I told, uh, I once taught this lesson and I was talking about a video that I saw of uh, uh, a man who was once um, a popular uh, name in the news media by the name Yasser Arafat. You know, I, I saw this video sometimes back. Yasser Arafat and the then Prime Minister of Israel and the American president were called to a meeting in the United States to try and settle the Middle East dispute. And uh, they went to a place called Camp David. I remember that video very well. And at Camp David, the idea was that, you know, after the tense discussions that they had, they needed time to breathe fresh air and just to take a stroll in the park. Guess what I saw in that video? I saw the American president. I saw the Israeli president. And there was yet another leader there. And there was Yasser Arafat. The other three that I mentioned first, they were walking together, rubbing shoulders. And Yasser Arafat was walking in the same line though, but there was a gap between him and the other three. They say a picture speaks a thousand words. And as they were walking, the American president then was Bill Clinton. He stretched his hand to reach out to the shoulder of Yasser Arafat and brought him closer. I looked at the video, I said, this is exactly sometimes what happens in the church. We have people that enjoy each other's company. We have a lonely sister, a lonely brother, but do we go out of our way to try and bring the lonely brother, the lonely sister, closer to everyone else so that together we can enjoy each other's company. Dissensions. Okay? So, brothers and sisters, you and I have a duty to love and also to see to it that we are all bound together. So, I thought maybe that one, I highlighted it in my notes. Uh, perhaps I should share that with you so that at least we have an appreciation of the list that uh, Paul is talking about. And uh, if you look at your notes, uh, what I did is that um, I um, uh, tried to uh, 
look at each and every one of those so that at least um, we can uh, understand what Paul is talking about, okay? And then he goes on to say in verse number 25, those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. All right, right quick. I want us to conclude by looking at verses 22 and verse number 23. Can I just say something? I must yes, think please. that no sin can enter heaven, right? We agree. That's true. And baptism is for the forgiveness of sin, according to Acts 2 verse 38. Mm -hmm. so, so this is talking of um, those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom. It's That's because right. no sin can enter heaven. That's true. Yes. You know, to put it in other words, you have just done that correctly. That's, you know, that's the bottom line. No sin in heaven. So whoever is found to be with sin, uh, whether it's mentioned with, within these categories or not, you know, no heaven. That's true and very correct. Thanks so much for your contribution. All right. Can somebody read for me verses 22 to verse number 23 right quick, please? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. All right. Okay. Did you get the grammar that... Uh, Paul is employing here. Is he saying fruits of the spirit or fruit of the spirit? Fruits. Meaning to say how many? One. <laughs> it's one, isn't it? But it's one fruit with all those things. Okay. One. But anyway. The light from golden ice. You used to call it a harvest. That's one thing. That's one harvest. Yes, it's one of it. Yes, that's it. Because you see, uh, one cannot say, I specialize in the fruit of peace, but I don't have love. It doesn't work that way. Okay? Every kitchen needs to have all those as one. It's like it a is... cluster of grapes. Okay? We need to understand this tone. We need to understand this presentation. Now, fruit has several important characteristics. Look at your notes. A Sorry, can I just is... say... Yes, Can I just please, say, someone? just to add to that point, um, if you yeah. bake a cake, you need eggs yes. and flour and sugar and okay and 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 to make one cake. All right, okay, I like that. You know, I never heard about that before. Thank you so much, Sister Mariana. I like that one. You have also uh, given me another truth. Yes, very correct. Okay, so. Even with the cake illustr illustration that you just talked about, if one ingredient is missing, then the cake doesn't come out right. Okay? Thank you for that. I like that. You know, we never stop. So, let us move on and quickly talk about the characteristics of a fruit. A fruit isn't achieved by working, but is birthed by abiding. So, or even the fruits that we see, the fruit will only come from a tree that is attached or whose branches are attached to the main trunk. And the fruit is fragile. 
and a fruit produces itself. A fruit is attractive. A fruit nourishes. So, uh, is somebody saying anything? Something? The fruit is mature. Yes. All right. You know, the list is not uh, exhaustive. You know, there is so much that we can add on as we look at the characteristics of a fruit. Okay. And in the notes there, we mentioned about plural and whatever it is to prove that it may be significant that the word fruit is singular. Paul is not speaking of a series of fruits that will be shared around so that one believer has one, another has another. No, rather he's referring to a cluster such that all the qualities are to be manifested in each believer as the illustration that our sister just talked about um, in as far as the cake is concerned. So he talks about love, right? Of course, you will see in your notes that according to Greek, uh, there is eros as love, there is philia as love, there is storge as love. Okay, that you can see and read in your spare time. Okay, and he talks about joy. All right, one of the greatest marketing strategies ever employed is to position the kingdom of Satan as a place where there is fun um, as compared to God's kingdom, okay? And that you can also read. Uh, I have um, each and every one of them covered under some notes. Now, in conclusion, let us look at verse number 24 and verse number 26. It says, in uh, keeping in step with the spirit those who are christ's have crucified the flesh okay they've crucified the the flesh the flesh is no longer in control but god's spirit is in conclusion, I want us to read in our notes the conclusion that we have. This whole chapter lends itself to a searching examination of ourselves. We often think that our problems and, dif and difficulties are all outside ourselves. We think that it would be fine if everyone just treated us right and if circumstances just got better. But that ignores the tenor of this whole chapter. The problems are in us and need to be dealt with by the Spirit of God. Augustine used to often pray, Lord, deliver me from that evil man myself. With that kind of reality check, we can see a new world, a new life, and not one another person. No other circumstance has to change. All we must do is to yield to the Spirit of God and begin to truly walk in His Spirit. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, once again, dear Lord, we approach your throne of mercy with gratitude in our hearts. Gratitude for having had this opportunity, dear Lord, to study a portion of your word. We pray that our God and Father, we will surrender our lives to you, to you our God, through your spirit. And that our God and Father, we will be there for each other in your kingdom. We pray that our God and Father, as we do that, the fruit of spirit 
will be manifest in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the students that turned up tonight. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the understanding that we need to appreciate your word. We pray that our God and Father, as we look at scripture, we might love it and embrace it so that we would be fully equipped to do all that you expect of us. I pray once more, dear Lord, as we disperse and go our separate ways, I pray for your protection upon each and every one of us. I pray that our God, if it be your will, we might come together again for the last chapter of the book of Galatians on Thursday. This is our prayer, dear, dear Lord, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let us just continue to engage each other. There is so much that uh, we can talk about from the book of Galatians. We cannot say it all, but uh, I tell you what, I enjoy the book of Galatians. And thank you for your attention. Um, let us read on. And uh, when we meet on Thursday, uh, you would have already um, read your notes. It will make life easier for all of us. So, good night and God bless. Thank you, Brother Neiman. Thank, thank you, you Sister Bella. Thank you thank so you. much, Wayne. Thank night you, night. thank you. All right, good night, everyone.